Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to be hosting this evening's program with Dean Job and Deborah Bloom. Um, we just spent some time in the green room and we had a tech run this afternoon. I've not had such a fun time talking about murders and poisonings and um, serial killers and all that stuff in, in the longest time. So I promise you, you're in for a real treat. Uh, this evening. And we'll get to that conversation in just a moment. I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do before I introduce our speakers tonight. Um, so starting with the fact that um, I, I see some of you are chatting already in the chat, please keep doing that. That's awesome. Um, and it's one of the kind of benefits of the virtual programming that we've been doing for so long now is that you actually can talk during the program, which you can't do during a live event, right? Um, but if you do have a question, we're going to have a, a Q&A session toward the end of the program. If you have a question for either Dean or Deborah, rather than put it in the chat, if I can ask you please to put it down in the ask a question area that you see at the bottom center of your screen. That will make that part of the program go a lot more smoothly, so please do that uh, if you will. And while we're looking at that part of the screen, I invite you to look just above Ask a Question where it says, your support is vital to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Please donate here. Um, we are really proud at the Mark Twain House and Museum of the fact that we've been able to remain engaged with our community, our audiences, and to build audiences uh, across the world, honestly, um, through these virtual programs. Um, but it hasn't been free and it hasn't been super easy. Um, we are really excited that we're back in business with our um, major revenue source, which is our guided house tour. And people are coming in droves. We're selling out regularly. Um, but we have a little bit of catch-up ball to play, honestly. Uh, and so I would just ask you, if you've been enjoying our programs, if you're excited about tonight's program, if you can show us by donating any amount, $5, $10, whatever you can give, uh, I just want you to know that every single penny was deeply appreciated by the board and the staff of the Mark Twain House, and every single penny is put to very, very good use. So thank you in advance for your support. Um, another way you can support us is by purchasing tonight's books, The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream by Dean Job and The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom. They um, are both awesome. Um, and listen, we know you can purchase these books elsewhere, but if you do make your purchase by clicking on the links that I've posted in the chat here this evening, uh, first of all, you get a signed copy, which is not the case always. And also your purchase supports the Mark Twain House and Museum. So we appreciate that very, very much. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, tonight's program, and like all of our virtual programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation, and our media sponsor is Connecticut Public WNPR. And our program is produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who's a beloved, um, recently uh, imparted uh, trustee of the museum. He's a great support, and we're, we're delighted to honor his legacy in this way. I want to invite you also to check out our annual gala, our major annual fundraiser. It's happening virtually on November 4th at 7 p.m. Eastern. The theme is Mark Twain Around the World, and we have guest appearances from uh, you wouldn't believe our lineup. Nelson DeMille, Jill Sabuel, Kevin Kwan, David Baldacci, Azar Nafisi, and many, many more, um, plus a huge array of really awesome auction items. So please go to marktwainhouse.org slash gala and I'll put that link in the chat in a few minutes, but I um, hope you'll be able to join us there. So I want to introduce our guests. Now, this is a, a kind of a, a program that came out of um, a, a talk that we offered in July when Deborah and Dean were here to talk about Dean's book, The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, which had just come out. And we had so much fun, we decided to do it again as part of what we're calling a Pick Your Poison Week. So last night we had a wonderful talk um, about the Gilded Edge with the author Catherine Pendergrast. And tomorrow night we're having a talk about whoops, this book, Drunk, with Edward Slingerland. But tonight we're talking about the case of the murderous Dr. Cream, the Poisoner's Handbook, and just you know, kind of general poisoning. Um, so we're excited about that. Deborah Bloom's the director of the Night Science Journalism Program at MIT and the publisher of Undark Magazine. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist, columnist, and author of six books, most recently The Poison Squad, a 2018 New York Times notable book. That book, as with all her most recent books, focuses on influential moments in the history of science. Others include the New York Times bestseller The Poisoner's Handbook, Ghost Hunters, 
and Lovett Goon Park. A co-editor of two editions of a field guide for science writers, she is now under contract with Oxford University Press as a co-editor of a forthcoming guide to science journalism. Dean Joe is an award-winning author and journalist and a professor at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where he teaches in the Master of Fine Arts and Creative Nonfiction program. His latest book, The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, The Hunt for a Victorian Era Serial Killer, published by Algonquin Books, we've just learned, and congratulations to you, Dean, is long listed for the American Library Association's very prestigious 2022 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. Awesome. He's also a finalist as the Chicago Writers Association's Nonfiction Book of the Year. He's the author of eight previous books, including The Jazz Age Con Man Tale, Empire of Deception, which the New York Times Book Review called intoxicating and impressively researched. Um, Dean's work appears in Crime Reads, The Irish Times, and The Washington Independent Review of Books, and he writes a monthly truth crime column, Stranger Than Fiction, for Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. We're delighted to have them back this evening. I'm going to bring them up and say hello. So everybody join me, please, in welcoming Dean Job and Deborah Bloom. Give me just a second to get everybody's mic open. Dean and Deborah, thank you for coming back to share another evening with us. It's so good to see you again. Thank you. It's such a delight to be back at the Mark Twain House and Museum. It was a wonderful experience last time, and I'm excited about tonight. Yes, thank you very much for having us back. Delighted to do so. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy with everybody else. Um, Deborah, will you let me know mm -hmm. when uh, it's time for me to come back up to help with the Q&A? Sure, I'd be glad to do that. All right, um, thank you. I'll see you then, then. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks. So Dean and I have had a wonderful week arguing over poisons and poisoners and, and which ones we wanted to do. And uh, we have some wonderful stories and, and dangerous materials to talk about with you. And I'm going to kick it off by talking about my favorite poison, which is arsenic, which I tell everyone, even when I'm not doing this talk, arsenic is a fabulous poison in all kinds of ways. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think so, and then I'm going to tell you about some of my favorite arsenic poisoners and, and then hand it off to Dean in a kind of mysterious way so he can talk about his favorite poison next. Why do I like arsenic so much? It's one of the more famous poisons in our homicidal history, dating back hundreds of years, and there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, if you were a poisoner, especially before this century, it was an ideal poison for a number of reasons. One, it is tasteless. You're a poisoner, you're planning to kill someone. You don't want any kind of signal that their food or drink is poisoned. You have arsenic, which is so tasteless that uh, scientists who were starting to study it in the 19th century would mix it into things like vanilla pudding where they could not taste it. It's also odorless, so there's no chemical warning. And it also mimics the symptoms of a natural illness. It's a broad spectrum poison. And so when you start getting sick with an acute dose of arsenic, uh, a teaspoon, say, uh, you'll have a sore throat. You'll have an upset stomach. You'll, you know, just generally feel like you're coming down with some kind of gastrointestinal infection. And so especially going into the 19th century, Arsenic was a wonderful poison. It, it mimicked natural illness. It gave out no warning signals. You could put it in just about anything and your victim wouldn't detect it. Uh, that started getting ruined by science in the mid 19th century. Uh, there was a British chemist, James Marsh, who figured out how to find arsenic in a corpse. It was kind of an iffy primitive test, but that was really the beginning, the arsenic, because it was so common. Uh, of the fact that people were looking at ways to actually find poisons in corpses. And in fact, arsenic, which is a metallic naturally occurring element, uh, then kind of set off a whole bunch of uh, research into other metallic elements and detecting them. Mercury, lead, antimony, gold and silver actually, right? How do you find those in bodies? 
And it wasn't until about the 1870s that scientists figured out how to detect plant poisons like strychnine or cyanide or uh, many of the other plant alkaloids. Nicotine was actually the first plant poison detected. So here's arsenic. Everyone loves it. And not only that, it's widely available. Right. So this would not be true today, but in the 19th century, arsenic was used to make candy green. It was used to make wallpaper green. There was, it, I mean, the uh, arsenic colors were called Paris green or Shields green. Uh, there's actually a lot of evidence that uh, Napoleon, the emperor Napoleon was killed by his wallpaper, which when he was in prison in Elba was dyed with arsenic. It was a Paris green wallpaper and the sea air has caused mold to grow in the wallpaper and it off-gassed arsen gas and kill them. So it was readily available there. It was available in cosmetic preparations like Fowler's solution. There's actually a theory that uh, Jane Austen accidentally poisoned herself with an arsenic cosmetic solution. So anyone who was interested in grabbing some arsenic and doing some harm could find it in, you know, in the pharmacy or in, in the hardware store. And so you have all of this going together to make it such a successful poison that its nickname in the 19th century was the inheritance powder. And so I want to now tell you about a couple really interesting arsenic murderers. Women, uh, you know, people will talk about arsenic being the woman's weapon, I mean, poison. That's not entirely true. But it is true that some of the great arsenic serial killers uh, used our uh, poison serial killers used arsenic. One of them is Marianne Cotton. She was a arsenic serial killer in the 1890s. She killed somewhere close to two dozen husbands, cousins, children, relatives with arsenic. And her preferred method was mixing it into the morning porridge before they actually figured out this pattern. Uh, she was eventually caught. She were, uh, was a poisoner in North England, um, caught, convicted, and hanged. And there are rhyme, nursery rhymes about Marianne Cotton lying in bed with her eyes open and rotten, right, to scare off other would-be mm -hmm. poisoners. Uh, one of the others, and I wanted to mention it specifically because the Mark Twain House is in Connecticut, is a woman named Amy Archer Gilligan. She ran a nursing home in the early 20th century in Windsor, Connecticut. She is believed to have killed a, about 40 of her residents and also her second husband with arsenic, which will also tell you we're now in another century that these tests for arsenic, one, were primitive, and two, people tended to incline to the logical theory, and because arsenic mimics a natural illness so well, she was able, because she was such a sweet little old lady, right? She was a sweet little old lady. She played the church organ church, church, church organ. <laughs> she played the organ at her church. She charmed everyone. No one suspected her because she was so nice. And so she was able to get away with this for quite a while until finally some of the relatives of people at the nursing home became suspicious. And once they started to look, the other thing that is a downside of arsenic is that it's a metallic poison. So it stays in your body and it actually will accumulate in your hair and your fingernails. One of the reasons we know that Napoleon, even from a couple hundred years ago, was killed by arsenic was because when they exhumed him, they were able to find arsenic in his hair. So arsenic is just a really fascinating, well-used, wonderful homicidal poison. And it's also a classic example of a weapon ruined by science. The fact that it's both detectable in a corpse and years after death has made it one of the least common poisons today. And with that, Dean, it's your turn to talk about another poison. Well, that's right. I, uh, I was joking uh, as we were talking about this that I'll, I'll take the, uh, the defense of team strychnine or strychnine as it's sometimes referred to, I guess, in the States. And um, it's one of the plant alkaloids that uh, Deborah mentioned. So 
uh, in the 19th century, um, it got dodgier to use arsenic, uh, despite the fact that superficially it could mimic other symptoms. It did leave a trace, and once the uh, the tests in the mid century came about, well, poisoners were were very taken with new plant based uh, vegetable alkaloids that were being found, and strychnine is. Uh, is from a plant uh, that has the uh, Latin name strychnos, uh, found in India, and it comes from the seed pod, and it is extremely lethal. Um, a death from strychnine is truly horrible. Uh, it causes uh, muscular uh, contractions. In fact, they're called tetanic uh, contractions because they look like tetanus contractions. The body arches. Uh, limbs become uncontrollable. Uh, the, uh, the 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 person is in a, almost like an epileptic or a, a very serious uh, seizure and excruciating pain, which then subsides. I mean, this is one of the insidious things about strychnine poisoning. The patient may think, or the the person who's ingested it may think that that's the end of it, only to have it recur. Uh, so. Uh, these horrible, painful, uh, muscle-wrenching uh, spasms interspersed with calm uh, where the, the uh, person who's ingested it is lucid, but they, they escalate to the point where finally uh, the person's heart uh, fails or um, their, their breathing stops. So uh, it's a nasty, a very nasty thing here on Team Strychnine. And uh, I'm drawn to it, I suppose, I have to be, because that was uh, Thomas Neal Cream's uh, poison of choice, weapon of choice. And uh, that's why he's the subject of my book, obviously, The Murderous Dr. Cream. Cream was a, uh, a doctor from Canada who, uh, early on in his medical career, uh, started killing patients, most of them women, either women who came to him for an illegal abortion or... Uh, at the end of his murderous rampage, it was uh, sex workers in London, England. But um, his weapon of choice, as I said, was strychnine. And he perfected a way of putting that into medicines or uh, and then finally into gelatin capsules, which were really just coming into vogue, the kind of uh, a time-release capsule we think of now. And he had to do that because strychnine is incredibly bitter. Uh, you can't even put it in coffee. And... Uh, so it has that uh, downside compared to arsenic. Um, but if you can get it into somebody, especially if they don't know, uh, as I said, extremely lethal. And Cream um, not only perfected this delivery method, but trusted as a doctor, uh, he was giving this to people, either official patients or people who knew he was a doctor and saying, take these pills before bed. So he actually perfected a way of killing from afar. His patients would go through uh, their death throes, these, these horrible contractions, and ultimately die after he was long gone. And uh, didn't really give him an alibi because uh, there were descriptions of this uh, man that matched his descriptions. But it's a chilling aspect of his case that he took some kind of perverted uh, uh, cruel pleasure in knowing what these pills were doing. And as a doctor, trained doctor, he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, what's strychnine doing hanging around anyway? And amazingly, it had, in the 19th century, it was seen to have therapeutic uses because in very minute traces, it was a muscle stimulant. It, uh, in a lethal dose, it throws the body and the nervous system into overdrive but it could be a muscle stimulant. So it was used in trace amounts in uh, many medicines at the time. That's how cream would have learned of it. This is a time when doctors were trained to compound or, or formulate their own medicines. And it also meant that he was able to uh, get a supply because as a doctor, uh, Deborah didn't mention this, but the other way to control poisons is not just to detect them, but control who can get them. And, uh, there were, uh, in England, it was, uh, the uh, vernacular term was the poison book. So it was a book where anyone purchasing uh, one of these lethal poisons, strychnine, arsenic, and others, would uh, have to sign their name. And sometimes if someone known to the pharmacist or this the dispensing person uh, to vouch for them. 
and uh, cream gut around this. Um, I'll mention another uh, uh, um, uh, strychnine aficionado, I guess, is that what we call them? Uh, but a woman named Christina uh, uh, Edmonds in Brighton in the 1870s. Um, she, it doesn't seem like she was having an affair with her doctor, but she was in love with her doctor. So she wanted to eliminate the doctor's wife. So she put strychnine in chocolates that she left for the doctor's wife. The doctor's wife didn't die, but got sick. And the doctor had his suspicion something was up, but didn't have proof that Christina Edmonds had, had, Christiana Edmonds had done this and didn't want to cause a scandal. Um, what she then set out to do was to try to make, to cover her tracks by trying to make her next attempt on the doctor's wife look like the act of some kind of maniac serial poisoner, which it was, it was her. She started inserting this into chocolates that were then uh, returned and resold and sickened many, many people in Brighton and ultimately killed a child and tried again to kill a doctor's wife and that's when it finally came to light that she was behind this so uh uh she was uh uh and and the the, the uh, controls over these uh poisonous substances were shown to be very ineffective because she simply went to uh, a dispensary a, a, a druggist and said i i want strychnine and course, well, why do you want it? Well, I want to kill some stray cats. Well, all she had to do was get someone to vote for her. And she literally went to the next store, got the clerk who didn't know her to come in and say, yes, this is her. And uh, that's how she got around it. So in the wake of her uh, being charged in her trial, there was a, a lot of hand wringing about just how it was far too easy. The press were vicious and saying it was far too easy for anyone who wanted to uh, get these substances to do it. And there are other cases where they would sell, for instance, a, a, a very uh, a non-lethal dose of strychnine, uh, but uh, a, uh, an enterprising poisoner could just go to multiple druggists and get a lethal dose. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, my case for strychnine. And uh, um, where should we go from here, Deborah? Well, strychnine is a great poison, and you know, your point about accessing poisons, it was much easier. The U.S. came, the U.S., which is, has tended to be very regulation slash consumer protection resistant, was much slower in adopting things like poison books. And also, just briefly to return to arsenic, it, it wasn't just that you could needed to go to a pharmacist, but you could go to the hardware store because a lot of the, and this is going to lead me into my next poison too, rat poisons, for instance, were arsenic. My favorite was called rough on rats. And it was basically <laughs> just arsenic trioxide. And in Poisoner's Handbook, which is a book which is about a couple of early 20th century American scientists trying to figure out how to catch poisoners. So the invention of forensic toxicology it's also a book about a whole bunch of different poisons in which every chapter, a, a poison is essentially a character. There's arsenic and cyanide and carbon monoxide and, and just poisons I find interesting. But the arsenic murderous in that book actually uh, uses rough on rats, rat poison to kill both her brother. And then eventually in a very twisted scheme uh, the wife of a friend because she wants the friend to marry her daughter. It actually was written up in a magazine story called Poison and Pedophilia, which will tell you how twisted it was. Um, and rat poisons were, in fact, a hugely successful way for poisoners to get hold of things that they wanted to use to kill people. And the other poison that I want to mention at this point is another personal favorite, thallium which is also curiously a metallic poison. I, there are uh, plant poisons that I am extremely fond of, but thallium is also a, a metallic poison. And it was also a very popular pesticide in the early 20th century. I mean, and a really dangerous broad spectrum poison. 
um, in that it also kind of mimics the symptoms of a natural illness and like arsenic and we have this curious relationship with poisons was used in some cosmetic formulas. So one of the symptoms of, arsen of thallium poisoning is that when you start getting to a lethal dose, your hair falls out. And so cosmetic companies in the United States in the early 1930s would sell it as a depilatory for women, you know, get rid of that unsightly mustache using our thallium based formula. And you would f actually find in the journals of the American Medical Association, these reports on women who are using it, they went bald, they then developed some of the other symptoms of thallium. You lose control of your limbs, you lose control of your nervous system. It's a, a wide spectrum poison um, that and a lethal one, not only to pests like rats, but to people. And it's been used by a number of, of poisoners throughout history. And, and curiously enough, because thallium is a restricted substance now, you cannot go anywhere and buy it unless, as Dean says, you're a doctor or a researcher, you have some special access to it. We still see thallium poisonings pop up, and they're usually by people who ha do have special access. So the story I want to mention is not one of the early 20th century ones, but one, I want to say this was about 2014 in New Jersey. <clears throat> and there was a, a chemist for Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm sure that Bristol Myers Squibb enjoyed all this publicity to the maps. But she was a chemist for Bristol Myers Squibb and they had thallium. It was one of the compounds they used for research. And she was going through a messy divorce with her husband. Her name was Tanley Lee. And she decided rather than dealing with all the hassle of divorce, she would kill him with thallium. And so, and thallium is also a tasteless poison. So she was just mixing it into his dinners. And he eventually became so sick, he ended up in Rutgers, the medical hospital at Rutgers. And they had no idea what was going on, right? He was developing numbness in his hand and his feet which is classic thallium poisoning. He was sinking into a coma, again, classic. And his hair was falling out. And, and they were just baffled, right? <laughs> None of their tests were showing anything. And the thing that was the weird coincidence about that case was that one of the nurses in Rutgers at that time had just come over from China and she had been attended at a thallium poisoning in China. So she's what she is looking at these symptoms and going, this can't be. But she went to the doctors and said, this really looks like thallium poisoning. And they agreed to run the tests and it came back positive. He was loaded with thallium, but, and there is an antidote. It's actually an antidote that involves cyanide, which helps bind the thallium out of your bloodstream. It's called Prussian blue but they couldn't get it to him in time they got it and they gave it to him but he died anyway so then when they started the criminal case they were like who in the world has access to thallium right and they were able to then go back they knew his wife was a chemist they were able to get brister miles squibs to co cooperate and they were able to show that she had signed out massive quantities of thallium for no long known reason because she wasn't a part of her research and she was convicted and went to jail. So I, I wanted to bring up that point in part because it's not that we see these classic poisoning as much now, but they don't go away. These are poisons that appeal to a certain kind of person, the poisoner personality, I suppose, right? The plotting and planning ahead kind of personality that you need to have to be a poisoner because poisoners are not, and Dean and I were talking about this earlier, a poisoner is never an impulse killer. It, you don't say, I'm really pissed off at you, so just stand there while I go research, <laughs> right? But I'm going to put in your coffee tomorrow morning. You actually have to plan it. And so mm. these poisons still keep coming back occasionally because there are people for which they really work. Not nice people, but they are there. Um, and I know Dean has some other kind of fascinating poisons he wanted to talk about. So back to you. Well, I, I want to talk about one called uh, aconite. Or am I saying that right? Is that uh, aconite? Aconite, right. Aconite, yeah. 
which uh, comes from a plant called monkshood or wolfbane. Um, and it comes from the root and it's been known for, uh, for ages to, to be, it was, uh, I, I hope I've got this right. Deborah can, can, can correct me, but it, it was, uh, used to, uh, on poison arrows in That's some right. cultures. That's and, right. uh, so it's uh, it's it's like strychnine. I guess I'm I'm showing my strychnine like bias. It's a vegetable alkaloid as well, and uh, again from the root of a plant, and um, also uh, uh, puts the patient or the uh, the person who's ingested it, the victim, into uh, uh, seizures and spasms and extremely painful. And I encountered this in my research for Dr. Cream because. Um, about a decade before Cream Stan's trial in London, and actually Cream had already killed six people in North America at this point in the early 1880s, but a, uh, a British doctor named George Henry Lamson uh, was accused of killing his uh, young brother-in-law. And uh, he had motive because Lamson uh, was addicted to morphine and uh, uh, was constantly in debt. His uh, medical practices kept falling apart because of his drug use. And he was desperate for money. And his wife's family had uh, had an inheritance split among them. So once he burned through his wife's money, he went after uh, this uh, young teenage uh, brother of hers uh, named Percy John. And uh, he devised a uh, very similar to cream. He put the aconite in a, a pill form or in a gelatin capsule. He uh, made one attempt on uh, uh, Percy's life, uh, which was unsuccessful, just sickened him. But then he showed up at a, uh, he was in a, uh, a private school in Wimbledon in the London area. And he was also uh, paralyzed. So he uh, couldn't walk. He uh, was in a wheelchair. And uh, under the guise of, of visiting him while he was uh, in the midst of heading to France on uh, for an appointment or whatever, uh, Lamson dropped in and uh, brought some cake. And there was originally some concern maybe he poisoned the cake, but then he cut it up and shared it with the headmaster. And it didn't seem like any poisoner would take the chance of getting the wrong slice. But he did say, you know, Percy, you're such a good pill taker. I want the headmaster to see how well these gelatin capsules work if he has trouble getting other students to take medicine and that's what gave him the fatal dose so uh nowhere near as clever as cream uh he was the obvious suspect brought back and stood trial but uh, there aren't a lot of cases i think of aconite it's uh, it's one of these more rare uh weaponized uh, uh poisons and uh but it does have and it's it's i think partly because it's harder to source uh, I don't know if it has any other real uses, uh, uh, but um, it um, it also, uh, there's no reliable test for it. So I just want to take a minute to come full circle on, you talked about lab tests. These plant alcohol, alkaloids really did pose a challenge for decades, for years, for scientists, as they scrambled to find ways to reliably detect these substances that people driven away from arsenic were starting to embrace as uh, the new, I, I, I think Deborah, you, you really, uh, you styled it in Poisoner's Handbook like an arms race. That yes. who, could get the, who could get ahead in this arms race? Would it be the good guys or the bad guys? Um, but um, the uh, toxicologist, uh, the, one of the top toxicologists in England uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, who was involved in both the lamps and and cream cases was a fellow named Thomas Stevenson. And the, he did run a lab test to detect uh, strychnine in some of cream's victims. Uh, of course, he wasn't able to run a lab test for uh, aconite. But uh, Stevenson had a, a very interesting um, superpower, let's put it that way. You might even think parlor trick. He claimed, and he claimed it to the satisfaction of judges and juries for years, that he could detect and differentiate between many strychnine, aconite, and other vegetable alkaloids by their taste and the burning and numbing sensation on his tongue. So if you're with me here, this is how we tested it. He would distill uh, liquid samples from cadavers and he would touch a sample to his tongue 
and then say it's this or it's that. Now, how many scientists would be willing to do that for their art or for the sake of science? I don't know. But it also talks about just how crude or, or certainly how uh, 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 dangerous uh, uh, poison detection was in, Victor in the Victorian era. Yes, and you're right, because when you go back and you look at some of the papers written by early toxicologists, you'll see a lot of it they do by testing it on themselves, you know, and, and you can actually find them saying, you know, and I, I couldn't breathe, I collapsed to the floor. I, I mean, these guys were insane risk takers in some way. Going back to plant alkaloids, you're absolutely right, and I talk about that some in Poisoner's Handbook, because you'll actually see, if you look at the records of poisoning in the 19th century, you'll see that uh, once they developed the test for arsenic and then they allied metallic poisons, antimony, and, and other ones that were used, you, there's a really is a shift to plant alkaloid poisoning. And I think I quoted a prosecutor from France who had just lost a poisoning case and, and actually sh started shouting in court, why doesn't everyone just use plant poisons? Because, the, you know, you're <laughs> bound to get away with it. He was so frustrated. And that did not change until the 1870s when there was a Belgian chemist who was obsessed about nicotine. I mean, nicotine is a really, again, a rarely used homicidal poison. And this involved an aristocratic family uh, who the wife and the husband were running out of money and they decided to kill her brother who had all the good stuff. And they, uh, hey, they had tobacco leaves. They were, you know, making their own cigarettes. And so they started stewing up the tobacco leaves for the nicotine and killed him with the nicotine. They made sort of nicotine teas. And this particular chemist, his name was Jean Gervais Stas was one of these weird uh, caveman dwelling obsessive chemists who almost never left his apartment. He just locked, where he had his lab, he just locked himself up. He was determined to find this. He was so outraged by this particular case. And so he did eventually figure out how to detect, uh, you know, nicotine in a corpse. And that was the gradual opening of the door to the detection of plant poisons, but it took a while. Right. We're deep into the 20th century, the first few decades of the 20th century before this really starts to unspool. And then, of course, you have the Industrial Revolution. So now you have all these industrial compounds also coming up. So it really was a kind of cat and mouse game between poisoners and toxicologists as they're sort of wrestling with how do I catch a poisoner? I mean, one of the things we see today, and this is not necessarily waxing about a poison, is that in general, the, people have this idea that here in the you know educated um, modern 21st century, everyone's using super sophisticated poison, but in fact, that's just not true. In general, poisoners use what is easily accessible. So at a time that strychnine or arsenic or thallium, you know, you could go down to the corner store and pick some up. That was what they used, right? Now mm -hmm. they tend to use, you know, readily available things like uh, vasoconstricting eye drops, right? Or uh, antifreeze. And I want to uh, mention one antifreeze case, again, from sort of the mid t I think this is like 2014, 2015. Uh, in Missouri, because it makes a really interesting case. And, and it's a case that's gotten a lot of attention. The woman who went to jail was named uh, Diane Stout. It's S-T-A-U-D-T-E. Um, so I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She was a, a sort of Amy Archer Gilligan. She, you know, was active in her church. She was a nurse. Everyone loved her. She, you know, or at least apparently up until the point that they realized that she had killed her husband, her son, and tried to poison her daughter, and she used antifreeze. Uh, antifreeze is also an interesting poison um, because until people started putting bittering agents in it, uh, it was a great poison. There was actually a, a consortium of manufacturers who, especially because pets would die of antifreeze poisoning, 
that finally just had, had enough of, I think, partly lawsuits, but also the problem. And so they got together and agreed they would add a bittering agent to antifreeze uh, early in the, you know, 2012 ish kind of time frame, uh, state by state, and then nationally about two years later in the US. But antifreeze is an interesting poison because what it does do is mimic, I, I mean, a lot of the good poisons, as opposed to the sort of extremely toxic, fast acting poisons like strychnine or cyanide or aconite, uh, you know, tend to come on a little more gradually. And, and the trick with antifreeze is that when we metabolize it, we metabolize it in a way that our body creates calcium oxalate crystals. And the calcium, there's where I'm the geeky science writers. These go to your kidneys and they slice and dice them. They're extremely sharp edge, nasty, tiny crystals, and they literally will cut the kidneys apart. And so they will, as they start doing this, they will mimic the symptoms of kidney disease, right? And so, and of course, all the problems of severe kidney damage happen. But a lot of times these would be misdiagnosed. You had to be looking for antifreeze, right? The, the active ingredient in antifreeze is diethylene glycol. And um, it's famous in U.S. food safety history because it was an ethylene dia, uh, diethylene glycol public poisoning case that created the modern FDA in 1937. And then I'm going to stop so we can go to questions. Um, someone used it to sweeten cough syrup for children in the United States and uh, several, a couple dozen children died. And so the F, the modern, the food drug and cosmetics act was passed in 1938 as a result of that. So you see people in the stout case, she went online and, and found antifreeze that hadn't been heard. You, I mean, again, what you see with poisoners is that they're, they're really interested in, in working out a plan and not being detected and in getting away with it. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer because I know we have some questions in the queue. Well, I think all of us um, would just love to listen to the two of you talk endlessly. This is so fascinating. And, um, you know, you feel a little guilty that you're so fascinated by this stuff, but it is absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to invoke host privilege. We do have some audience questions, but um, I have a question of my own, uh, and it refers back to something we talked about during our tech run earlier today, which is, you know, we were all so terrified at certain points and by news reports about ricin. Am I saying that correctly, R-I-C-I-N? Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, it seemed like a little dab will do you, and you uh, could be anywhere. And there was that famous case with the umbrella stabbing. And um, I was saying that you know, we have a reservoir here, and we were told that if somebody put like a little tiny drop of rice in the, the reservoir, all of us would be at risk of being killed by it. But you helped me put that in perspective earlier today, Deborah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yes, and I and ricin tends to bring me to kind of our moment point. So one of the things, so ricin is a is a famous, a, extremely poisonous compound. Uh, it's made from the castor bean, in very small doses, um, if you use it the right way, right. And so there was a famous poisoning of a, a, a Eastern European spy. I'm pretty sure Bulgarian in London who was stabbed in, in near the knee or in the back of the knee with a sharpened umbrella that was loaded with ricin and he just keeled over and died. Mm -hmm. And so people looked at that because the amount of ricin was so tiny and said, this is insane. This is such a small poison and it's lethal at almost non-detectable levels, right? Super exciting poison that then got hugely amplified by popular culture. They made it on the show Breaking Bad. And after Breaking Bad, you saw this outbreak of ridiculous attempted ricin poisonings, right? I, I actually wrote about it when I was blogging about Poison for Wired. Uh, you know, people would put ricin on their girlfriend's pizza and have it delivered and, the, and, and all these <laughs> other things, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously you know, they go out and get some castor beans or whatever. I mean, the whole thing was, in my opinion, stupid. The thing about ricin it is, is it is acutely toxic, 
toxic if it's injected. You take it only a tiny, tiny amount to kill you if it goes directly into the bloodstream, which clearly these evil spies knew when they, you know, stabbed the guy in the leg with the rice and umbrella. But if you eat it, it takes a whole lot more. If you drink it, which is why it would be completely give me a break if you put it into a reservoir, it, it would do nothing. You need a whole lot in a glass of water with ricin to actually have a problem. And and as you guys probably remember, there was this whole thing where people would put ricin in envelopes and mail it to people. And again, yeah. it's a little more dangerous than hail, but again, it's not that bad. So you tell me, aside from this Russian spy or this Bulgarian spy, who do you know has died of ricin from all these poisoned pizzas and loaded envelopes? Nobody. And nobody because you have to really get it into the bloodstream for it to be dangerous. But how did it how did it get, how did that escalate? So I mean, because I'm not alone in, in having been terrified that uh, that, that rice was going to kill me somehow oh, inadvertently. Yeah. So some of it, you know, is a you know not that I want. I'm a science journalist, so I hate to dang the media. But what people would do is they would take the um, it's the le the the acute toxicity dose for injection, which was came, was widely shared after that uh, espionage poisoning. And they go, look at this, you know, it takes, you know, a hundred millionth, I don't have the exact number at hand, but a hundred millionth of a gram of rice and killed this guy, right? Tiny amount. So tiny that, you know, it might even be beyond the, well, it wasn't beyond the limit of detection because they figured it out, right? But <laughs> so tiny that it's not very easily to detect and therefore this is a terrible poison. And it is true in the nature is dangerous way that some of the most lethal substances on earth are natural substances, right? Aconitine, which is the alkaloid involved with aconite, is insanely poisonous at a small dose, right? I mean, just a tiny, tiny amount. And one of the most poisonous subst uh, substances on earth is made by bacteria, it's botulinum A, right? If you're old enough, you'll remember botulism poisoning from canned goods right? That is a super lethal poison. So when people looked at ricin, which is a plant alkaloid, they were like, holy crap, this is so lethal at such a small dose. And like the ricin mythology spread everywhere. And then you had a, a very popular television series, Breaking Bad, in which they wholly exaggerated ricin toxicity. And all these gullible people, get me started on this, but all these really <laughs> people watching the show are like, oh, I'm going to take out my girlfriend with a pizza, right? Um, so, you know, we misunderstand sometimes what's dangerous and what's not and what we should worry about and what is not. Uh, just to go back to arsenic for a minute, my favorite poison. Uh, uh, arsenic is one of the few poisons that is dangerous both at the acute level and at a part per billion. I, I mean, the US drinking water standard for arsenic is 10 parts per billion. And at 50 parts per billion, it causes active harm. So not all poisons are like that. I um, mean, you know, not all of them are as multi-talented as arsenic, which is one of the reasons I find it so interesting. And ricin is not one of them. Ricin is acutely dangerous if it's delivered the right way. Right. And so it, 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 it's worth your while to say, let me know a little bit more about this poison and how it works before you let it panic you. And if I someone put an eyedropper of arsenic in my reservoir, I'd be happy to swim in it. Right. I'm just delighted to be part of a conversation about arsenic versus strychnine, which is the better poison. <laughs> <laughs> it, I never I never thought this would be my life. Um, let's, let's see what some of the audience questions are. Um, William Brown says, was laudan laudanum used as a poison in the 19th century? Well, that's Morning. I'll, I'll let you, yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's just going to say, I, I thought it was like morphine if it wasn't. Uh, absolutely. And of course, uh, that has been used today uh, with lethal injections. Um, but uh, it uh, it was fairly common, and uh, um, you can take over, uh, Deborah. You may know more about it, but I know I have seen many cases where that was the uh, uh, the poison used. Yes, I mean again, it's like poisons were used once at hand, and laudanum was a morphine solution. It was given 
often given to women. It's famous in the late 20th, 19th century for being given to women who were overexcited, you know, chill, calm down, take a dose of laudanum before you go to bed. And the use of uh, things like morphine and cocaine at that time period, it was completely unregulated. So it wasn't just that you saw morphine and laudanum, but the cocaine was put into uh, like soothing lotions for kids who were teething, right? Oh, wow, really? And there was cocaine and wine. It was called Vin Mariani, right? You can, and there were what they called medicated soft drinks. Coca-Cola, of course, was re originally a cocaine-based beverage, which is where it got its name. And it was started in the late 19th century. And only they only took the cocaine out in the early 20th century. And 7-Up was originally a lithium-based soft drink. So it picked you up because it had an antidepressant in it, lithium, right? And so when you go back to this period, these kind of narcotics are hugely available. And Dean is right. They turned up in all kinds of different cases. And one of my favorite, I wish you may know this guy's name, Dean. I'm reaching for it, but he was a medical student in New York. He killed his girlfriend with morphine and then to avoid the telltale pin pricking of her pupils, he dropped belladonna atropine in her eyes and that causes your pupils to dilate. So he countered the effect of the morphine by dropping atropine into her eyes and dilating her pupils and they still caught him. And there was a, a famous toxicologist in New York. He was a total dick, but he was a good toxicologist. <laughs> named, <sorry. laughs> named Rich, named Whithouse, um, Rudolph Whithouse. And he was the guy who testified in the trial. And just to show you how horrible he was, the way that he showed the jury how this had worked, first the morphine killing and then the belladonna, is he killed a cat in the courthouse. And so he killed it with morphine. You remember this case, right? You remember the guy's name? It was Harris. Well, there was uh, there were two ca Harris, uh, Carlisle Harris. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And there was one right after that, uh, Dr. Buchanan. Yes. Who actually came from uh, came from Nova Scotia to practice in New York. I did. Uh, an interesting that. case. And uh, Buchanan tried to uh, uh, overcome uh, Carlisle Harris's mistakes. But you're right that uh, he thought he could uh, he could hide this telltale uh, 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 dilation of the pupil uh, and uh, and get away with murder, you know, which he didn't. <laughs> and he didn't didn't he talk about it publicly? He was like bragging to his friends that he knew how to overcome this morphine identification yeah. thing. They all ratted him out, right? So. Well, those two cases uh, because they're within a year or so of each other and and are linked. Uh, and actually were both exposed by uh, a uh, journalist, investigative journalist of the New York world. I get them confused who came first, but uh, Carlisle Harris is the more uh, is the more notorious of the two. And you're right, he was a medical student, wanted to get rid of his, his wife, girlfriend. Buchanan, uh, married, a girlfriend. Uh, Buchanan was uh, married to, uh, uh, was married and wanted to get rid of his wife. And uh, so they, uh, they uh, almost identical crimes, almost... Uh, identical times. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I love the kind of failed plotting. I mean, all, all the people that Dean and I are talking about is people who thought they were going to get away with it and didn't, right? Which is also it's, important. Well, which begs Maybe. the question, how many people did get away with it? I mean, we, we, may, we might just be looking at the tip of a very big iceberg here, huh? Well, that's a really good point because Deborah had alluded to the fact, I mean, we're talking about a time when, uh, you know, you could get sick from water. Uh, uh, in the 1880s, uh, they, uh, they called the uh, uh, dysentery was known as the summer complaint because the water was so polluted, everybody was getting something. So if you had, uh, you know, uh, intestinal uh, diseases like that that were common, uh, it was, and, and people, and of course, premature death uh, was, more, was more common. Sudden death was more common and often unexplained by the medicine of the time. So it was easier for uh, uh, for uh, poisoners to get away with it. And Cream actually, um, I would mentioned he killed four women in uh, London, England. Part of the reason he was able to kill so many was the first one was chalked up to suicide, even though the police themselves wondered, well, how did this woman ever get a 
a poison that only doctors can can get and the second despite obvious symptoms of uh, strychnine poisoning was chalked up to natural causes so it was very common and uh, that that was a, a problem and and again less of a problem now uh, because uh, many of the uh, what were then common diseases or complaints are, are more under control now you know that is such an i hadn't thought about it but if you go back to the 19th century and, and this is not from poisoner's handbook but from the poison squad book i did which is about food safety uh, medical historians call the 19th century the century of the great american stomach ache because <laughs> what people ate was so lousy so often i mean we always think about our pink you know pink cheek rosy ancestors like dining off farm fresh food but that really wasn't the case and manufactured food was horrible and people were made sick by their food all the time dean is right you know bacterial infections like tomain and waterborne diseases and so you know the poisonings that cropped up blended into the background in some ways in a way that they don't today. Today, we're generally more healthy. Yes, we have uh, Mexican onions was the latest thing the FDA flagged, right? And, and occasional outbreaks of salmonella and, and other issues like that. But in general, we're so much healthier that poisonings stand out in an interesting way, that, in a way that they didn't in the 19th century because of the general Ill, Ill health. That's a really good point that I had not thought about. Wow. And I, I think great. maybe this is as good a time as any for uh, the legal team's uh, disclaimer. Don't try this at home, please. This is an academic exercise. This isn't a how-to guide. No, that's exactly right. And poisoners do get caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. They all get caught every time. That's Thank right. you, Dean, for bringing that up. Uh, the Marshall yes. House Museum uh, and our our, uh, <laughs> our team really appreciate that. So Mallory, so Mallory is my beloved colleague whose idea it was in the first place to invite the two of you back in July. And then um, she had the idea for the Pick Your Poison Week that we're experiencing right now. So she's in the audience tonight and she says, what's the most painful poison to die from and what's the least painful one? I don't know what she's planning. I'm just, I'm just relaying her question. Well, I, I certainly, uh, not, not to keep shilling for Team Strychnine, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, I, I know uh, one, uh, one scientist, uh, uh, science writer, uh, says, you know, uh, has basically said in the, uh, given what the, the symptoms and then the impact I, I mentioned, uh, said that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the truly terrible poisons. But uh, Deborah, you. You hang in this crowd more than me. What do you think? I mean, I agree with you that the strychnines and the cyanides and the aconite, Cyanide, yeah. yes, are, are really painful poison deaths, right? They're, and th those are very quick acting abrasive poisons, right? And so, and, and you're going to suffer. Uh, some of the um, radioactive poisons like polonium 210 that, that um, the Russian dissident Alexander Litvinenko were killed with or poisoned, but those are, you know, really poisons of espionage. Probably the least pain, painful poison that I'm aware of is carbon monoxide. Um, and in general, what happens when people are exposed to carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide uh, binds with the hemoglobin in your blood about, it's, it has about a 200 times as strong a bond with hemoglobin as oxygen. So it, gradually just forces the oxygen out of your bloodstream and you get sleepy, right? And so you've probably heard of occasional cases where people will commit suicide by shutting their garage doors, running their cars, filling the garage with carbon monoxide. And they do that because that is a, one of the less uh, painful ways to be killed by poison, right? You just gradually have less and less oxygen in your system and you get sleepier and sleepier. Carbon monoxide is a very efficient poison, right? I, I say admiringly, um, you know, if you get enough carbon monoxide in any given situation, it's just going to kill you because you're not going to get enough oxygen in your system. Um, and people will 
you know, go to sleep at night with a carbon monoxide leak and die, right? It doesn't wake them up. It's yeah. not painful. So that would be my choice for not an admirable poison, but certainly one that's not as painful. Well, how about um, natural gas? Um, you know, they, I know they add uh, uh, something to it so that we can smell it, but I, I know that natural gas is also um, similar to carbon. carbon it contains carbon way. monoxide, right? And that's why they, they add chloropicrin. Look how a geek I am about this stuff, but they add a compound called chloropicrin, which has a slightly bitterish smell. So I have a gas stove in my house. And if it doesn't, you know, the starter part of the burner doesn't start right away, I'll get this waft of this smell, which I'll say, oh, that's the natural gas, but it's really the chloropicrin because carbon monoxide itself is odorless. So if you're running a, a car, I actually wrote about a carbon, uh, carbon monoxide deaths of two little girls in Florida where the mom um, had, uh, had forgot to turn off the engine in her car in the garage and it ran all night and they were having a sleepover in a, a downstairs room next to the garage and the carbon monoxide killed both of them, but nobody smelled it, right? The car doesn't have that additive in it. The natural gas we have in our home does. And at the period I was writing about in Poisoner's Handbook, which was the 1920s and 30s, they had not added any kind of uh, bittering agent. So, and there was a lot of use of carbon monoxide for gas lighting. It was called illuminating gas, right? It was the gas they used to wear gas lighting. It, it was really a horribly dangerous gas because it contained uh, carbon monoxide that wasn't tainted and it contained hydrogen. So if you had an illuminating gas leak in your house or apartment and you lit up a cigarette, you'd blow up your house, right? Because of the hydrogen. Or if you didn't light a cigarette, the, the carbon monoxide would kill you. And there was um, one of the things I wrote about in that book was a guy who uh, strangled, essentially strangled his wife and then broke a gas fitting to try to pretend it was one of the common illuminating gas oh, deaths. Wow. And when the toxicologist showed up, he looked at the young woman's corpse. Uh, the guy had taken an insurance policy out of it, and it was pale. And he said, that that's not an illuminating gas step because when you are killed by carbon monoxide, that bond between carbon monoxide and, and the hemoglobin is so strong, it changes the color of your blood and it flushes a much more cherry pink than normal. And people who see uh, corpses, people who have died from carbon monoxide poison, will talk about how healthy they look. They're all pink chipped, right? The skin is kind of rosy. And so when he saw this woman and he was pale, he knew it couldn't have been carbon monoxide. It's actually a wow. wonderful story of chemical detection, but don't, wow. but yeah. I mean, this is a fast, the forensic toxicology history and the way that people get caught that in itself is a wonderful story, right? I love the way science works to catch people, the way a Neil Cream was caught after all the ingenuous things he did to disguise his quicknine poisoning, the way this guy, Harry Freinlich, was caught after all his efforts to stage an illuminating gas death, right? It's wonderful stuff. Do you, it's a little after eight, and usually we we uh, kind of wrap up at eight, but we have a couple more audience questions. Are you willing to hang in here and uh, answer yeah. a few more questions? Thank you. Sure. I um, mean, if people are willing to stay, we are happy to talk poison. I think people are absolutely riveted and hanging on your every word. <laughs> um, so um, uh, Elizabeth Robbins asks uh, if you can talk about any historical figures who've been killed by poison. That's a really good question. Well, I, uh, uh, well, I'll just jump in uh, uh, that uh, looking at uh, looking uh, doing some research on strychnine again. Uh, there, there seems See, to be a rumor that Alfred. Did, I know, I know. <laughs> but um, well, I, I wanted I wanted to have a specialty uh, given uh, Deborah's vast knowledge of so many poisons. <laughs> Alexander the Great, apparently. Uh, there's a rumor. Yeah, I don't know if you know that one, Deborah, that he might have been poisoned with strychnine. No, and, I um, Well, this is Wikipedia, but it was uh, it was sourced to uh, to a study. So uh, 
uh, it may be one of, of many culprits, but I'll throw that one out and then toss it to you now for the next one. Well, one of my favorite early poisoners is a woman named LaCosta. She was hired by Nero's mother to kill. She wanted her son Nero to be emperor of Rome, and she hired LaCosta to kill her husband. And in fact, she did, she used a whole mix of poisons, but one of the things she did was give him a poison that made him death, deathly ill in a, you know, just super stomach upset. And then she said, I'm going to give, this is kind of gross actually, I'm going to give you a feather enema and she put poison on the feather. And so she killed him and then Nero wanted to get rid of his stepbrother who he felt was a threat to him and he hired her again and she killed the stepbrother with uh, poisonous mushrooms right and so she's a classic example of uh, a royal family hiring a poisoner to do the dirty work and we do see that you know throughout history and of course then you have uh poison suicides like cleopatra and her ass right as well so um and then you of course you just see sort of um other um poisonings of major figures in the history who are probably less notable alexander litvinenko the russian dissident i mentioned um is a good example of that because he had been a real challenge to vladimir putin and uh, he moved to London to continue his dissident work. And Putin decided to kill him with um, polonium-210, which is a radioactive decay element of uh, uranium. And, and you can only really get at it if you have nuclear reactors. It, it, you know, it's generated by nuclear reactors. And he had these two assassins come from Russia, came to the UK with these vials of plutonium-210, which is tasteless, of course, it's just a radioactive element. And they put him, they met him for tea and they put it in his tea. And so, and he eventually died in the hospital. But my favorite part of that story is that they left these radioactive footprints everywhere. They left so much radiation on the British Airways flight into London. They had to stripped the entire interior of that plane out. The seats were radioactive. The aisles were radioactive. The tea room was radioactive, right? They had this, once they realized what was going on, they had these like incredibly just lit up everything with these radioactive poisons, right? So. And, uh, and when was this again, Deborah? I mean, I want to say this was about 10 years ago. Yeah, I think that's long yeah, ago. More yeah. recently, there were a couple of Russian dissidents who died in England. I don't know why everyone goes to England to kill people. And I cannot remember that poison, but um, a, a spy and his daughter, a former spy and his daughter, were both killed with a different... Do you remember what that poison was, Dean? I can't remember it. I don't remember that one, but of course, there's the opposition leader who just recently uh, was almost killed by poison. And, um, you know, to answer the question, the Medicis, uh, where they were famous, right. were they not? That, that dynasty in, in Italy. And, uh, and uh, I also, there's a great book called The Affair of the Poisons. Uh, well, that's what the, the thing is called. Uh, in the 17th century France, there was just a, uh, a spate of poisons poisonings right. of prominent people that led all the way to Versailles and the royal court. The so court uh, royal there had been court. many... Many, yeah, the, the, there have been many, uh, uh, as you said, the inheritance powder, uh, as arsenic was known. I mean, sometimes that could be to try to inherit a position or a throne, uh, not just to speed up an inheritance. That's exactly right. Wow. So Mike says, why do people choose poison versus other means of, of killing people? You know, get away with murder, cause pain. Um, is it? You know, why, 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 from what you've researched and understand, why do people who want to kill other people choose poison sometimes? I mean, I can jump you, in. yeah, then you why? did. I, I mean, yeah. to me, that's one of the core baffling questions because, and, and I do write a lot about poisons. Um, 
and I think everyone has access to poisons, right? We all do. We've got them in our house. We can get them, obviously, pick up antifreeze or whatever. We don't use them. So there's something really distinctive about the people who choose to use poisons. And part of it is a, a particular personality. I mean, people who are poisoners are, are planners and plotters. And so they start out by wanting to eliminate someone and they and they start out by also thinking, how can I best get away from this? So you're never in a state of rage or fury or fear, right? You're more planning and you're more also thinking of it as a game that you're going to win, right? So there's, and which I actually think is one of the reasons that poisonings are rare because not most, so many other killers are for, killings are for other reasons and they're not that planned out. Um, these are really this unique group of people who like to plan and plot and think things out and and do their homework and do their research. And in some ways, I had an argument about my husband with my husband about this because he goes, uh, you know, poisonings are passive aggressive. And I'm like, really? Right. <laughs> And so, as opposed to, and then I came up with all these other violent ways to kill people. Um, but the fact of the matter is that in some ways, poisonings appeal to people who don't want the confrontation, right? They yeah. don't They yeah. don't want the violent confrontation. Sometimes there are people who don't think they're going to win that confrontation, right? So instead, and this is one of the reasons that people speculate if you look at FBI statistics, women are about, if you look at FBI statistics over the last decade in the United States, 90% uh, of homicides in the United States are committed by men. A uh, percentage of those, a small percentage of those are poison murders, but because so many of uh, the murders in the United States are committed by men, there are actually numerically more po male poisoners than females. But when you break down those numbers even further, you'll find that when women are picking a, whim, a weapon, they'll choose poison about seven times as often as men, right? I, I was going to ask about that. That That's fascinating. It makes complete sense when you explain it that way. Yes. And so some of it is, uh, and, and we certainly see this in cases of domestic abuse, say, you know, where a woman is uh, with a dangerous domestic partner and she gets a gun and he takes the, way from, the gun away from her and kills her. That's a U.S. story as opposed to a Canadian story, obviously. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, but a lot of the times that women choose poison is because they don't want the confrontation, right? They want to get rid of a problem. They're in a dangerous relationship or they're a really awful person who sees financial gain. I don't want to sound like they're all victims. Some of them are not. Some of them are just really bad people. And they think this is their best way of getting to uh, the money they want. And I, when I look at this, you know, you'll see a category among profilers of what they call comfort killers. And a lot of poisoners, Amy Archer Gilligan, who, you know, killed 40 people and then was able to get their money, right, is considered a comfort killer. And comfort killers kill for their personal comfort. I'm going to gain financially if I take you out, right? And we do see that often in poisoning, the combination of the planning and the need to um, enrich yourself, right, also shows up in poison killings. Do you have i mean neil cream is an example of what dean well i guess, I guess to build on the idea that it, uh, i don't know if passive aggressive is is the way to put it but i think there's something there uh i mean the, the aggression is the killing but the sort of underhanded or almost sneaky way of doing it as you said i mean murders are pretty up close and personal mostly poison enables the killer to to not even be there Right. This was Cream's big thing. He could kill from afar. And um, uh, it does take so much planning and deliberation, and there's never any provocation or or uh, uh, lashing out in the moment. As you said, you know, I'm going to lash out, uh, you know, I hate you, I'm going to kill you, just hold on a minute, I have to go down to the drugstore and get some stuff. Yeah. You know, it's right. not going to work, right? Oh, but uh, so, there, so there is that, I suppose there is that uh, that appeal. And and the more that a killer plans it, they may delude themselves into thinking they're getting closer to the perfect crime. 
you know, whether it's Carlisle Harris saying, well, I can get around the symptoms or it's cream saying I can find a better way to deliver this bitter strychnine dose in a pill. Um, so there may be some of that working, but as we talked about in some of our earlier discussions, I mean, poison is really the ultimate first degree or aggravated murder. Uh, it takes planning and premeditation. So the poisoner really is the, uh, if, if, if there's a, if there are degrees of evil in murderers, it's, it's easily one of the most evil because yeah. of the thought and preparation. I mean, right down to, hmm, which, which poison will I choose? Hmm, I'll choose this one. You know, there's just so much that goes into it uh, beyond, uh, you know, just grabbing a weapon. Yes. And, and is that, do you, do you think, um, and this might be where we uh, end, but is that part of the appeal to the poisoner, the, the intellectual engagement and the, is there some, uh, do they get off on the planning and the, the pondering and the savoring of the anticipation of doing this? I mean, that it seems like that must be part of the, the reason they choose poisoning over other, other means. It I, did seem to be a factor with cream. Uh, there was a lot of thought that he somehow took uh, just a ghoulish evil delight in knowing what he was doing to imagining what he was doing to his victims because he was long gone from the scene. Uh, Deborah, your thoughts on that? I agree with that. I think, you know, I mean, I've thought about this some, and, and one of the things you see with poison killers is they re often don't stop with one. They, and you certainly saw that with Neil Cream, right? They get away yeah. with it. It reinforces their, their sense that they're smarter than, right? And there's a certain personality, I think, that loves that feeling of being smarter than. So if you have a Marianne Cotton, for instance, who kills more than 20 people, think how smart she felt. She got away with it over and over again, right? Or, or an Amy Archer Gilligan, again, you know, you're fooling everyone. And there's probably an amazing feedback loop to that. And, and there's a little bit, I don't think this explains it because true psychopaths are really rare. But I had a conversation years ago when I was uh, writing about biology of behavior for a newspaper in California with Robert Hare, who's a Canadian psychologist who developed what's known as the psychopathy checklist where when people come into prison and, and you're like, is this person a psychopath? I don't know what triggers the taking of the test. Hair psychopathy checklist is what they look, use to figure out if someone is a true psychopath. And when I was talking to him about it, he said the number one characteristic of psychopaths is not that they're murderers. It's that they're game players. So they don't emotionally connect with other people. What they see as other people as sort of chess pieces on this game they're playing to win. And so, and there's really interesting brain imagery work with true psychopaths in which they'll uh, do these kind of emotional exercises and they'll ask them to look at different words, you know, mom, sister, table, chair, and the parts of your brain that normally emotionally light up for mom or sister don't light up with psychopaths. It looks exactly the same when you say mom and when you say chair, right? So they're wired in a way that they don't feel that emotional connection, but they really light up in the pleasure parts of their brain when they win the game, right? And I don't think, I asked myself this about poisoners, that, that they are all psychopaths because so many people aren't right uh they, they, people who are heads of major corporations actually test positive on the psychopathy checklist the same kind of indifference to others and interest in playing the game you don't have to be a killer but i do think there's an element of that the love of the game the delight in the win that you see in poisoners in, in a way that you don't always see in other killers it makes them a little scary well, well, I'm I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Um, I'm going to worry about all kinds of things. But in the meantime, I'm going to encourage everybody. I can't imagine uh, that if you weren't determined to buy these books before this conversation, that you are not determined now. Please um, order uh, a copy through the links in the chat. The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom and The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, which we hope wins the Carnegie Award. Um, and uh, we're going to be watching that theme. And 
you know, I want the two of you to come back and, and do these things like six times a year. This is the most fun. Um, and uh, it's been such a fascinating conversation. So just real quickly, tell each of you, please tell us what you're working on for next. What's the next big project? You're ahead of me. Um, I'm, uh, um, I've got a contract with Algonquin Books again, and we're uh, working with my editor, Amy Dash, there, and she's, we have a great relationship, and uh, I'm uh, doing another true crime book, this one back in the jazz age, the 20s. Uh, my yeah. book uh, before Cream was about a con man, a Ponzi schemer in Chicago in the 20s, and this one's about a, uh, a gentleman jewel thief, and I, I call it uh, Catch Me If You Can meets The Great Gatsby. So, uh, oh, wow. it's, um, and I can put the term rollicking in, which I was saying earlier in one of our discussions, <laughs> it was a little hard to put before Cream's name, uh, but yeah. it is a real, uh, it's a real uh, uh, tale of, uh, of wealth and, uh, and uh, uh, the wealthy being uh, taken advantage of and uh, this you know, gentleman jewel thief who ingratiates himself with uh, the elite while he's planning to uh, rob their uh, country estates in the New York area. So uh, uh, I think it's a great story. Oh, sounds fun. It sounds fun. fun. How, how about you, Deborah? <laughs> so I'm not as far along with Dane, but I, I do want to give a shout out to the Mark Twain Nelson Museum. So the last time that Dean and I got together, we were really focusing on his terrific book about Neil Cream. And in the middle of that conversation, I, I suddenly went off on this riff about underappreciated female poisoners, right? Not that I don't appreciate Neil Cream, but that I feel like there are so many interesting women poisoners who don't get the attention of some of the male serial killers that we all know so well, the Ted Bundys and the John Wayne Gacy's. And I feel like, I feel strongly as a woman that there are women who are just as terrible and have done just as terrible things and that we should acknowledge that and know more about them and not underestimate women in the way that I feel that we do when it comes to murder. So I have actually, uh, my editor is now, um, looking at my proposal on a book about the great underappreciated female poisoners who are interesting to me um, in particular because they tell us different things about ourselves or our history or our culture or about the psychology of killers. And um, I, I expect to sign that contract this month. So I'm very excited about it. And I deeply appreciate you, Jennifer, and everyone at the Mark Twain House of Museum who inspired me, and Dean, who inspired me to think about this particular question and write this proposal. And, and didn't, uh, didn't Amy Asher Gilling come up from a, 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 a yes. comment from an audience member? And yes, and that was That's really, right. yeah. yes, those people, I was talking, I think I was talking about arsenic killers, and everyone goes, Amy Archer Gilling, and I, and I thought, who is that, right? I literally, uh, once I got off the, uh, out of the event, I rushed off to look her up and she's just an amazing poisoner. She's actually um, an inspiration for the play and movie Arsenic and Old Lace. And it is such a good example this person, of the way we underestimate. I mean, here is someone who's an incredibly successful poisoner for decades. And no one suspects her because she's such a ditzy, sweet, adorable, elderly woman. And I, and I thought about, she was actually another inspiration for me because I started thinking about the way we under, underestimate these people. And frankly, uh, I thought about the way we underestimate, I'm sure that the elderly women of the world will appreciate me <laughs> saying this this way. But the fact that, you know, a lot of times we also underestimate older women. I know that to be true. And, and and we should also acknowledge that no matter what your age, you can be a really good murderer. Right? Awesome. That so, is a great way to end this program. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's an inspirational story, right? Yes. I, I, you know, I, I would put that on my LinkedIn if, if it were part of my repertoire. So. <laughs> Dean and Deborah, thank you so much for joining us again. And this has been fascinating and delightful. And um, can we do it again another time when your new books come out, perhaps? Certainly. Love right. change. Seriously. We'll inter we could interview each other. Yes. <laughs> well, you, you two can just run with it. 
Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for being here and for your great uh, questions. And um, yeah, thank don't, you. don't forget to buy the books. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.